Jeremiah chapter 44. Most of you know that I love the prophet Jeremiah. I fell in love with him and his writings many years ago because I saw so much of what happened in his day was happening in our day. And I could identify with him so much because of uh, the coldness of the nation that he lived in towards the things of God. And God has uh, used this book to speak to my heart many times over the years. And I have preached many messages out of the book of Jeremiah. And uh, he's one of the patriarchs that one of these days I look forward to getting to meet. And isn't it wonderful? God has given us these wonderful accounts of how he has moved in people's lives and how they've affected our lives. And one of these days we get to meet them. What a day that's going to be. And you know what? They're, they're going to be concerned about how God moved in our life. And we'll be able to share uh, the greatness of Jesus in each of our lives. But by the time we get to Jeremiah chapter 44, you have to understand Jeremiah was called to preach to an uncircumcised of heart and wicked people. People whose hearts had been transformed away from the things of God and they worshiped and served false gods. And when God called Jeremiah, he told him that he had made him an iron pillar because he was going to have to be strong against this crowd. And Jeremiah preached for years on end that they needed to repent. And they mocked him, and they laughed him. They had their false preachers get up and preach and say, no, God said everything's going to be wonderful. Just keep going the way you're going. And they put him in prison, and they put him in the stocks outside the temple, and they mistreated the man of God. But by the time we get down to chapter 44, God had had enough. And God has sent judgment to Jerusalem and to Judah. And in chapter 44, the message carries on to the Jews that have been dispersed to other parts of the world. They are living in other regions, but they are still God's people. And can I say, no matter where you are, if you're saved by the good grace of God, you're still God's people, and you're still responsible for the things of God. A lot of times we get to thinking, well, you know, I'm not here, I'm not there. You're still one of God's people. You're still responsible for the whole counsel of the word of God. So with that in mind, let's begin reading in verse number one. The Bible says, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, which dwell at Migdal, and at Tapanes, and at Noph, and in the country of Pathros, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, ye have seen all the evil that I brought upon Jerusalem, and upon all the cities of Judah, and behold, this day they are a desolation, and no man dwelleth therein. Because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. Howbeit I send unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, O oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. But they hearken not, nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness to burn no incense unto other gods. Let's pray. Our Father. We thank you again for the privilege of being in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for the good prayer time, the good fellowship time, and we thank you for the good testimonies. And God, we're glad you're well able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Now, Father, as we've assembled here tonight, we come looking unto thee, the author and finisher of our faith, and looking unto your word, the perfect law of liberty, that we might find your direction and your will for our lives. Now, Father, I pray that, Lord, uh, the word of God would not fall on deaf ears, and I pray that it would find itself uh, uh, with, uh, received with gladness and receptive hearts and receptive minds uh, for folks to not only hear it but become doers of it, that they might be the people of God you'd have them to be. Now, Father, use us for thy glory. Use this unworthy vessel. Help us tonight. And Lord, I thank you and praise you for what you'll do. Save that one nearest hell. 
And God, I pray for that one again that may, might be here in body, but their heart is far from you. I pray you'd bring that heart under submission to you. And Father, I pray for those that, Lord, uh, uh, may just be going through the motions that they'd find that, Lord, uh, uh, a relationship with you is more than just going through the motions. So Father, have your will and way. Bless now, and we'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' holy name we ask these things. Amen. And amen. I want to draw your attention to several things. The first thing I want you to notice is the worldly dwelling. The worldly dwelling. Verse number one, it says that the word came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, Migdal, Topanes, Noph, and Pathros. These are folks dwelling in places where they shouldn't have been dwelling. These are folks uh, uh, consumed with places. Uh, that uh, uh, were taking them away from uh, the very will of God for their lives. Uh, can I say, even in our day, some dwell in a spiritual Egypt. Egypt here is a picture of troubles. It is a picture of oppression. And there are some who tend to dwell in oppressive states. Uh, even though the word of God says, thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, even though he has given us the formula to overcome uh, uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, even though his uh, word is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet, uh, even though his promises are forever sure, uh, there are some who tend to ignore all the things of God and to dwell in their troubles and love the troubles they dwell in. There's some people that just love being miserable. You know, life's too short to be miserable. And can I say, life is hard. Can I say, uh, life will throw you some curveballs along the way, and knowing that, and that there are storms on the horizon, why would we choose to live miserably every day? Shouldn't we strive to get the best out of every day? But there are some who dwell in Egypt. They dwell in troubles. Uh, they relish in them. You've heard me say this. There are some people you learn. Don't ask them how they're doing because they're going to tell you. And then you'll wish you would have plucked your eyeballs out with a fork before you ask that question ever again. Because they're just tr trouble, trouble, trouble. Huh? Uh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. You know, that, that's where they dwell. That's terrible. If you're saved by the good grace of God, the Spirit of God indwells you, uh, it doesn't matter what you face. He's got peace. He's got joy. He's got love. He's got hope. He's got assurance. Uh, uh, you can rise above the trouble, but see, there are some people that choose to relish in it because they like the attention. Oh, I got it so bad. I need your help. Huh? Well, suck it up. Life's rough. Everybody's got it bad. Everybody's got it hard. But it's what you choose to do with it. Some dwell in troubles. Can I say this? Some dwell in Migdal. Migdal is a picture of a tower of pride. There are some who dwell in their pride. There are some who will not admit they're wrong. There are some who will not humble themselves before God. There are some who will not admit that God's right and they're wrong. There are some who will not admit that uh, 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 they have uh, made wrong choices. They uh, uh, will justify everything they do because of their sorry, no good, rotten, stinking pride. Yep. Yeah, sure. Can I say God resists the proud but give grace to the humble? Amen. Yes. Can I say um, pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall? That's it. And there are some who choose to dwell in, dwell in pride. Uh, they got some kind of weird mirror. You know, you used to, they had the fun houses. You can go in and some mirrors make you look odd and weird. They got some of them mirrors in their house because they look in the mirror, they see something a whole lot different than everybody else sees when they look at them. Uh, seriously, you got the right kind of mirror. You look in and, and you really look at it. There's nothing much to be impressed with. What God ever saw in us, I don't know. So who are we to rise up in pride and think that we know more than God? There are some who dwell in troubles. There are some who dwell in the tower of pride. And then there are some who dwell in top panties. That is a place of temptation. 
There's some who just dwell in temptation. Now listen to me. The Bible says, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The Bible gives us exactly what we need to live in victory, to live in joy, to live in peace, to have an abundant life. But there are some who choose not to live the Bible way. There are some who choose to uh, not draw nigh to God. There are some who like living on the fringe as close to the world as they can, and their life is always full of temptation. Huh? Mess with fire, you're going to get what? You know, there, there are some people's lives is always wrecked because they live in temptation. And aren't you glad even the Bible lets us know that with temptation, God makes a way of escape? Yeah. But they don't look with, for the way of escape. They like the temptation. They like flirting with the danger. They like trying to think they're getting away with something. You're not. Why would you want to dwell there? Where all you got to do is hiccup and you fall into sin. You ought to run from that. You ought to shoe evil like Job did. Yeah. Run from the temptation. Because yeah. I want to tell you, your flesh is weak. There's some who dwell in temptation. Then there are some who dwell in Noph. Noph was a place that was known for drops from the honeycomb. It's a place of treasures. There are some who are always seeking to live in the things of this world. They want houses and cars and lands and big bank accounts, and they, they seek uh, 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 for a life of ease through money and the things of money and the things money brings. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's a problem when money has you, and that's where these people dwell. The love of money is the root of all evil. And these people dwell in their treasures. There are people whose things have them. They're consumed by them. You ought to be consumed with Jesus. You ought to be consumed with the Bible. You ought to be consumed with the house of God and the people of God. You ought to lay up your treasures in heaven. But there's some who want that ease of a life here. And again, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. And if God's blessed you to have nice things, you ought to praise God for it. But you ought to realize where they came from. But there's some who choose to dwell in treasures, not and then some dwell at Pathros. Pathros was a place of ruin. They dwell in tragedy. There are some who dwell in tragedies. There are some who relish in their life being miserable all the time. Instead of seeing the glass half full, they see it half empty. Hmm? They just dwell in tragedy. Huh? And there are some people, tragedy never leaves their, leaves their home. And they dwell there. They like it. They think that's the way life should be. Listen, any day our home can face a tragedy, but you don't have to dwell in the tragedy. Hmm? The Lord allowed tragedy to come to your life so people could see how you handle tragedy. But if you dwell there, you're not going to impact anybody for the honor and glory of God. There are people who dwell in tragedy. Huh? Uh, can I say we have had people have tragedy hit their home and they haven't come back to church since. But you see them and they'll tell you how wonderful God is. Let me just help you with something. If you're not faithful to the things of God, God is not blessing your life. Now you can try and convince yourself all you want to. But God honors faithfulness. There are people trying to convince themselves they're right with God, living void of the things of God. It doesn't work. Amen. God does not honor unfaithfulness. But there are people who dwell in these places. Listen, I hate that folks face tragedy. That's just part of life. Blame that on Adam and Eve. But I'm, I've got good news. There's a great day coming where we're going to a land where there will be no more tragedy. So we see the worldly dwelling. If you dwell in these places of the world, it'll bring you down. It'll hurt your testimony. It'll rob you of your joy. It will cause your life to be meaningless towards the things of God. If we're not a vessel of honor to God, then our vessel is vain. So we see worldly dwelling. I want you to notice something else in these verses. Notice the wickedness in verse 3. It says, because of their wonderful attitude. Is that what it says? No. So it's because of their wickedness. 
which they have committed to provoke me to anger in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. They were worshiping in a wicked way. They had come up with their own system of worship uh, that denied God his glory uh, and they were expecting God to be pleased with it. God said, you didn't know this, your fathers didn't know this, uh, nor anybody else knew this because I didn't give this, you chose to do this. And he says, it's wicked before God. And can I say, whenever we choose to worship God from the statutes of our own heart, it's wicked before God. Amen. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We see their wickedness. We see the worldly dwelling. Notice the warning in verse number four. How be it, God says in other words, regardless of how wicked you've been, how be it, I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing, which is that I hate. We see God sends a warning. God's always had a man to stand and declare the righteousness of God. God's always had a man to preach, don't do it. God's always had a man to stand and preach to reveal ungodliness and wickedness and unrighteousness. But Israel was guilty of doing with what a lot of people do today. They mistreated the prophets of God. Some don't physically lay hands on him today. They just ignore what he has to say. Some don't physically... Uh, abuse him but they'll go by the dinner table and they'll abuse him they'll chew him up and spit him out anybody that'll listen and they ignore the things that God is trying to establish listen you can listen to the scriptures and listen to the man of God when he stands and preaches or you don't but one day you're going to pay the price for it and you see the warning the wickedness and the worldly dwelling but here's what I want you to see. Notice the willful rebellion. Look at verse number 5. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness. God sent a message to change them, but they didn't listen to it. They didn't turn from their wickedness. They didn't hearken to what God said. Look at verse 10. They are not humbled even unto this day, Neither have they feared, nor walked in my law, nor in my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. They didn't hearken. They weren't humbled. They didn't walk in the things of God. Look at verse 16. As for the word, this is their response to the preaching. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But... We will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings, our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. Well, they said we're going to continue to offer up sacrifice to the queen of heaven, pour out drink offerings unto there. By the way, this was uh, 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 hundreds of years before Mary came on the scene. Uh, uh, Mary worship, mother-child worship, has been going on a lot longer than 1,700 years. Uh, you can take it all the way back to Genesis chapter 10 in Babylon. Uh, it's always been a form of pagan worship. Uh, and they were doing it then. They're doing it now. Uh, uh, God's taken this uh, uh, generation of today and called that wicked church uh, uh, the great whore which deceived the nations. Uh, uh, but... Uh, Listen to what they said. They said, we will not hearken to the word you brought us from the Lord, but we'll do whatsoever goes out of our own mouths. We'll make up our own mind how we're going to serve God. How many times does the preacher have to preach on faithfulness? And yet, come Sunday, Sunday morning, they'll hear it, but they don't come back Sunday night. They don't come back Wednesday night. And it's not because they're providentially hindered. It's because of verse 17. They're going to do what comes out of their own mouth. That's dangerous. Amen, sir. God's help, this is what I want to preach on. I want to look at verse number 5. 
It says, but they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness. I'm going to preach on when people refuse to change. When people refuse to change. You've heard me quote this verse a lot. James chapter 4 verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, doeth it not to him, it is sin. When we refuse to do what God says, when we refuse to do what we know that God says, it is sin in our lives. And when we refuse to change, there's consequences of that. Now God is long-suffering to usward. God will deal with us and will deal with us and will deal with us and will show us and will show us, but there comes a time when God says enough is enough and that is it. Friends, it's a dangerous thing not to do what God says to do. Can I say, first of all, when people refuse to change, they face suffering a fall. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. When you refuse to change, you refuse to hearken to the voice of God, when you refuse to humble yourself before God and do what the Lord says, you face suffering a fall. And can I say, uh, when Saul, the king, fell, it said, great was the fall thereof. See, when you fall, you don't fall alone. You always take people with you. There are people who are watching your life to see if what you have is real, and when you fall, they fall over you and die and go to hell. There's family members that are watching you. It goes beyond you, and it touches your children. It touches your grandchildren. It touches your brothers and sisters. It even touches your church family when you fall. When people refuse to change, they face suffering a fall. I know people that the Lord has had mercy on, they've gotten right with God, but it affected their family, won't have nothing to do with God. It's a dangerous thing to continue hand, hand running down the path that you choose to run down. Not only do they face suffering a fall, can I say, they, they, people when they refuse to change, they face stuff, starving their own soul. Look at verse number 12. It says, they shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine. Two times it mentions famine. They die spiritually because their soul starves to death. Everybody will feed on something. You'll either feed on the world or you'll feed on the things of God. When you refuse to change and you feed on the things of the world, you'll starve your soul to death. There are people who come to the house of God, they're not ready to worship because their soul is empty. It is starved to death. You ever see anybody that's starved? You ever see them little babies in Africa whose stomachs blowed up and they're, they're starving to death? You think they got strength enough to get up and build anything? There are anemic Christians who are starved to death because they refuse to change. They have no strength to serve God because they're dead spiritually. They're starved to death because they have refused to change. God has said, this is what you need to do. And they say, no, we won't do it. We're going to do it our way. I remind you, Jeremiah in chapter number 6 told them to walk in the old paths. That was the good way. They'd find rest for their soul. And they said, we will not walk therein. How many times do we have to preach on putting God first? How many times do we have to preach on uh, uh, seeking Him first? How many times do we have to preach on being faithful? How many times do we need to preach on uh, uh, bringing all your tithes in the storehouse? I mean, I, those are things I should never ever have to preach on. After we teach it in, uh, uh, when folks get saved, we teach it in new converts class, I ought to never have to preach on that, but continually have to preach on folks have to pray, read the Bible, be faithful. Why? Because re people refuse to do it. They face suffering a fall. They face starving their soul. You know why you need the Word of God every day? Just like you need natural food every day. If not, you're going to starve. That's why folks come to the house of God and they don't know what to do with what God has to say. Because they're starved. Listen, if I anticipate I'm going to go to a nice restaurant and I don't eat the night before or all day long, when I go there I can't hardly eat. But if I pack away about four meals before I go there, look out. I'll put a hurting on it. Same way, if you don't eat all week, when you come, you can't receive it. It's too much for you. 
you face starving your soul when you refuse to change. When people refuse to change, they face shame and embarrassment. Look what else he has to say in verse number 12. He says, And they shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. You know what it is when your body excretes something? It's not something you like to show off. As a matter of fact, I'm glad when Miss Hannah has blows out a diaper, Brother Lawrence don't come out and say, look what she did. She's just really getting rid of her father out of her life is what she's doing. No, it's nothing we're proud of. He said not only that, a curse and a reproach and an astonishment. You suffer shame and embarrassment. You know why some people that are out of church don't get right with the Lord and come back to church? Because they're embarrassed because of what their life has become because they refuse to change. They know we're not going to judge them. They've been members here. They know better. Why don't they come back? Because they're ashamed. Embarrassed that they got in that place in the first place. See, when you refuse to change, you face suffering, shame, and embarrassment. Not only that, when people refuse to change, it's a progression. They face suffering a fall, then they face starving their soul, then they face shame and embarrassment, but then they face severe judgment. It's one thing to be embarrassed. It's another thing when God severely judges you. Look at verse 13. God says, For I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Look at verse 23. Because you have burned incense, and because you have sinned against the Lord, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil is happened unto you as at this day. He punishes them severely because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And not only did they not obey the voice of the Lord, they didn't walk in his law, they didn't walk in his statutes, they didn't walk in his testimonies, uh, and that's why severe judgment came. Listen, the Bible says that if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard and not a son. God knows how to chasten his children. Again, he is long-suffering. He does not run to the uh, uh, correction uh, 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 iron or the, con uh, the, the uh, spiritual paddle, so to speak, and he doesn't look forward to uh, uh, bringing that rod of correction to us and, and discipline us right away. He uh, deals with us about our sin. He gives us a space to get it right with God, but there comes a point where God says enough is enough, and when we continue to refuse to change, God will severely punish his children. He knows how to get your attention. And by the way, when God punishes you, you know it's God. Hmm? I didn't get many whippings in my life. You can tell. That's the way I act the way I do. But when I got them, I know who was giving them to me. And I know why I was getting them. You ain't going to believe this, but most of the whippings I got was over my mouth. I'd have took a whipping every day, all day long. My mother one time washed my mouth out with soap. Give me a whipping. Don't put that stinking stuff in my mouth. Light me up. Do not. I mean, she lathered that stuff up that thick. and Oh, man, I spit soap for days. Huh? All I did was quote what something little Elizabeth said on the Waltons. That is a wicked show. <laughs> But I knew why she, I still know, it's been, that was mercy. That was 45 years ago. I still remember why I got punished. I hated that, and I hated having put my nose in the corner. I hated that. Anybody ever have to do that? Go stand and put your nose in the corner. That was the prerequisite to timeouts. I hated it. Go put, why do I got to stand here and put my nose, and you sit there, is this long enough? No, stand there until you know what you did. Well, I know what I did. Can I leave that? No. 
I'll never forget. I tried that on Jordan one time. He's little. I was like, go put your nose in the corner. He just laughed. He thought that was the funniest, stupidest thing. He just sat there and laughed. I'd say, hey, you punch the kid just laughing at you. <laughs> then I wanted to light him up, but I couldn't because I was laughing at him laughing. <laughs> he did. He's cracking up, rolling up, put my nose in the corner. Why? He's just laughing. <laughs> Goofy kid. But when God severely judges you, you know it. But there are those who are severely judged and they still live in denial and they refuse to change. I could name people after people after people that have left the house of God who's had nothing but tragedy and problems and heartache hit their homes over and over and over again and they'll still make excuse for why they're where they are and they don't get right with God. Why would you want to live that way? I mean, I've known folks that have to go get on medicine to calm their nerves where if all they do is repent and get right with God, their nerves would be just fine. But they continue to refuse to change. Well, there's another step. God doesn't stop with severe judgment. Then you face his sovereign wrath. It's one thing if he punishes you, he does it to straighten you out so you'll get right. But if you refuse to get right, then you're going to face his wrath. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Look with me at verse 27. Verse 27, the Bible says, Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. When God brings sovereign wrath to your life, you know what he does? He allows the devil to bring evil into your life, and he watches over the evil, and he doesn't send any good. Now, who in the world would want to face his sovereign wrath? When God takes his hand off of you and takes his hedge away from you and allows evil to affect your life, all because you got too much stinking pride to refuse to change. I've known people that had to face the wrath of God. And invariably, Brother Brian, everyone will say, I wish I'd have got right with God. Because God knows exactly how to get your attention. It's a wonderful thing to live in the peace of God and the benefits of God and the blessings of God. But when God removes all of that and strips you down to nothing, you'll be like Job. Job feared the day he was born. He cursed the day he was born. Then let me say this lastly, because it don't end there. I've known people even face the wrath of God and know that they should have gotten right with God and didn't get right with God. When people refuse to change, it always ends with a shortened life. Verse 27 goes on to say this, And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth because of how they dealt with the things of God and how they dealt with the church of God he said for this cause many of you are sickly. In other words they had faced a fall they had faced severe judgment and they were sickly. And then he went on to say, and many of you sleep. In other words, they went to an early grave. Amen. He went on another place to say that he had turned some over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. When people refuse to change... They face a shortened life. God will destroy this flesh. You see, what happens is, is God will deal and deal and deal. And when folks suffer a fall, he'll continue to try and re redeem them. When they uh, uh, get to the point to where uh, uh, they starve their soul, he still tries to deal with them. Uh, when they get to where they're shamed and embarrassed, he still tries to deal with them. When they suffer severe judgment, he's trying to reclaim them uh, and restore them. When even he puts his sovereign wrath in their life, he's still looking for restoration. But if they continually refuse to change 
we leave God no choice to destroy this flesh so we'll quit being a shame and embarrassment to him and his church. You say, well, he rewards them to go to heaven. They go to heaven shamed and embarrassed and without any rewards. At the great judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, when Christ gives us our rewards for how we served him and were obedient, we'll take those rewards and lay them back at his feet because he alone is worthy. There is nothing more horrifying for a saint of God to bow before the throne of God and have nothing to give back. He gave his best. Shouldn't you desire to have something to lay at his feet? Those who face a shortened life have nothing to lay at the Savior's feet. What a sad commentary and testimony of a life. All because folks refuse to change. The message has been very clear. When God speaks, embrace it. Be thankful for it. You say, well, my flesh don't like it. Your flesh don't like a lot of things of the Bible. Amen. But God's way is the good way. Do what thus saith the Lord. Our one rule, mind the Lord. John 2, 5, whatsoever he saith, do it. Do what God says. Be obedient. If he tells you to get right, get right. If he tells you to do right, do right. Every facet of your life, be right. Because you don't want to suffer what happens when you refuse to change. It's real simple. God gives us all choice. We'll choose to go His way or go our way. There's consequences for the choices. You go His way, you'll find it's the good way. It's a way of rest. It's a way where you have a friend that sticketh closer to a brother. It's a way even when heartaches come, he lifts you up, he mends you, he helps you, and he even blesses you when you're in his way. When you choose to go your way, it's the hard way. The way of a transgressor is hard. You'll find no hope, no peace, no rest, no fellowship. You'll find a, a, a groping in the darkness. You never find light. You never find solace. And everything you seek to find pleasure in, it turns to, around to bite you. And there's nothing but heartache. Who wants to live that way? Especially the saints of God. The Bible says where much is given, much is required. These folks that God severely punished in the way that we read after tonight, they had no Bible. We do. They were not indwelled by the Holy Ghost. We do. How much more does it require from us? They had no house of worship like we do. So my dear friends, embrace the things of God. Don't rebel against them. Do what God says. Don't reject them. His friend going down that path doesn't end well. I want to finish right. I want to do right. I want Jesus to be pleased with my life. When he shows me there are things I'm wrong, I want to get them right. I don't want to refuse to change. The problem is we all hate change. We hate it. We like doing things the way we're accustomed to doing them. Sometimes those ways aren't the best way, and those aren't the God's way. Amen. Do it God's way. And my friend, you'll never regret following him. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Maybe God spoke to your heart. How faithful have you been with the things of God? I'm glad for them second, third, fourth, fifth chances. Maybe tonight you need to find an altar prayer and ask God to forgive you and then change. Have a change of heart and change your mind towards the things of God. Maybe you're here tonight and God's laid on your heart. You need to go get something made right with somebody. Go get it made right. 
So while they're picking out a song, we stand, folks are praying, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, we love John 3, 16, but Jeremiah 44 is just as much the word of God as John chapter 3. Lord, I'm thankful for them Old Testament saints, and Lord, you gave them for our examples and how you dealt with people's lives in the past. And God, we're to glean from those and grow thereby. So Father, help us, Lord, to always strive to do what you tell us to do. Lord, you know our yesterdays, you know our todays, and you even know our tomorrows. You know what is needed and what is best. Lord, we can uh, save ourselves from a lot of life's pitfalls if we just follow you, walk hand in hand with you. Now, Father, have your will and wait in this invitation. Some are already in the altar. Help them, God, you know what's needed. God, help folks be honest with God tonight and help them to mind the Lord. And God, if we need to change, show us where we need to change. Show us the error of our ways. Lord, in Haggai's day, you said, consider your ways. God, help us to do that tonight. Lord, help us to break up our fallow ground. And help us, God, to become meat for the Master's use. God, get glory to your name. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.